Thank you, Larry, and good morning. Last week we finished our studies in 2 Timothy, and this week we're beginning a series in the book of Jeremiah. And so our passage this morning is Jeremiah chapter 1, and we'll look at the entire chapter. I'm just going to read the first half of it. But this is uh, a series that we have titled Studies in Jeremiah, because I'm not going to go through every chapter of the book. I've taken some select passages, and uh, we will look at those. But uh, we're going to begin with the first chapter, and uh, follow along with me as I read. The words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, of the priests who were in Anatoth, in the land of Benjamin, to whom the word of the Lord came in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, in the thirteenth year of his reign, came also in the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, until the end of the eleventh year of Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, until the exile of Jerusalem in the fifth month. Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I have appointed you a prophet to the nations. Then I said, Alas, Lord God, behold, I do not know how to speak, because I am a youth. But the Lord said to me, Do not say I am a youth. Because everywhere I send you, you shall go, and all that I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. Then the Lord stretched out his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. See, I have appointed you this day over the nations and over the kingdoms to pluck up and to break down to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. May the Lord bless this reading of his word and bless our time of studying it together. Let's bow in a word of prayer. That's a great hymn. In fact, those words, Great is thy faithfulness, were penned by Jeremiah. That's in the book of Lamentations, and we're not in that book. In 2 Corinthians 2, Paul spoke of his ministry of preaching, and he said, we, and he's referring to all of the prophets and the apostles and the preachers, are a fragrance of Christ to some and a fragrance of death to others. As many as people are who are blessed by God's word, by the preaching of God's word, there are also those who are offended by it. Preaching makes enemies. So he then said, who is sufficient for these things? We don't find those words in Jeremiah chapter 1, but they are there in spirit because when God first called the young prophet to his ministry, he tried to dodge it. It was too awesome for him, too fearful. Who is sufficient for these things? That, that is the question of our passage. And the answer is, not you, not me, not Paul, not Jeremiah. But the Lord is. He's more than sufficient, and he is with us. That's the lesson. And the proof of that, the proof that he is absolutely sufficient is given in the descriptions and the words that he says that speak of his absolute sovereignty. That's why he's sufficient. That's the, the first of our studies in this series of studies in the book of Jeremiah. And it's a book classified among the major prophets of the Old Testament. The major prophets are Isaiah and Ezekiel, and between them, Jeremiah. It's a long book, a book of 52 chapters. 
We'll uh, look at a few of those chapters, but it covers a period of over 40 years of the prophet's life who had a very hard ministry. He prophesied during the declining years of the southern kingdom. It was a time of widespread unbelief and apostasy, which ended in the fall of Judah and the Babylonian captivity. Isaiah's ministry had ended about 100 years before. Amos, Micah, and Nahum were all contemporaries of Isaiah. They were all gone. And the nation was spiritually hard as rock. Jeremiah wasn't alone, though. Zephaniah and Habakkuk were contemporaries. Ezekiel and Daniel would arise toward the end of his ministry and prophesy in Babylon. So, as always, the Lord has his remnant of believing people. He leaves a witness in the world. But certainly in Jeremiah's day, it was a small one. He lived in a time much like ours. Think of all the blessings we've had in this land. Think of all the revivals this nation has had, the preaching it has heard, the opportunities it has had. And still, this is a secular and materialistic age we live in. The church is weak and without much influence. If you feel like you are, are, are all alone, a small minority in an ocean of unbelief, that was Jeremiah's experience. So we can identify with him like prophets in a wilderness. There were some hopeful signs during his life. The reform of King Josiah occurred in the early part of his ministry in which all of the idols and pagan practices were removed from the land. But it was a reform from the top down, a reform that had been imposed on the nation, and people's hearts can't be changed by government regulation. Uh, after Josiah's death, the people quickly returned to pagan practices. They put idols in the temple and sacrificed their children in the flames to Baal and Molech. That was the age in which Jeremiah was called to minister. So much of the book is about calling people to repentance. And much of his ministry was filled with prophecies of judgment. The book, the book can be divided roughly into two parts. Chapters 1 through 45 contain prophecies to Judah. And chapters 45 through 52 are prophecies to the nations, to the Gentiles. So Jeremiah's scope was worldwide. In fact, here in chapter 1, the Lord tells him, I have appointed you over the nations and over the kingdoms to pluck up and break down. And much of Jeremiah's ministry was giving prophecies of the Lord throwing down nations. But it's not all judgment. In fact, some of the most hopeful prophecies in the Bible were given by Jeremiah. Chapter 31 gives the promise of the new covenant where God promises to write His law on the hearts of His people so that they will have the knowledge of Him and they will have the will and desire to obey Him. Chapters 32 and 33 are about the branch, which is a term that is taken from Isaiah, and it's a reference to the Messiah. That's a title of the Messiah. And so Jeremiah preaches on the Messiah and about the Messianic age to come, the kingdom to come. And so in Jeremiah, as in Isaiah and all the prophets, the future was seen with great hope. It's about glory to come. It's about triumph. It's about the victory of God's people. But the hope Jeremiah offered was largely rejected by his generation. And because he was a faithful prophet and uncompromising in his message, which was largely negative, there was widespread resentment toward him from his countrymen. He was considered a traitor. He was persecuted severely and at times gave in to his feelings of disappointment for 
the injustice that he experienced as well and pre predominantly for his sorrow over the nation itself, its condition and the judgment that was coming. And so he's been called the weeping prophet. But because his personal life is such an open book to us, the weeping prophet has also been called the most human prophet. More is known about Jeremiah's life than any other prophet. A lot of biographical information is given here in this first chapter, which records his call to the ministry. According to verse 1, Jeremiah was descended from priests. His father was Hilkiah, who may have been a descendant of Abiathar, a priest with David, and of the house of Eli. He was from the town of Anatoth in the tribe of Benjamin, about three miles northeast of Jerusalem. When I lived in Jerusalem many years ago, I would sometimes take walks on the Sabbath. The buses weren't running on the Sabbath. They still don't run on the Sabbath, and that was the only means of transportation we had. So I would walk sometimes on the Sabbath, and I'd walk up to a hill that overlooked Anatoth, and you could sit on a bench and look down. I'd look down on that village, and I'd think about Jeremiah. Well, today it's an Arab village with a mosque and minaret. But in his day, it was a priestly town for Levites and within walking distance of Jerusalem. Jeremiah would often walk to the city and enter the temple and preach there against the people's sin. Verse 2 gives the date of his call. It was in the 13th year of Josiah's reign. And he ministered through the reigns of all of the last kings of Judah until the exile and the sack of Jerusalem. He was a young man when he was called. He calls himself a youth in verse 6. That Hebrew word generally refers to someone between the ages of 16 and 18. So he was young. In fact, that became part of his excuse for resisting the call. He was a lot like Moses an unwilling prophet. Jeremiah said that the word of the Lord came to him saying, in verse 5, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I have appointed you a prophet to the nations. So from the beginning, at a young age, Jeremiah was made to know that the Lord is absolutely sovereign. He is the eternal, omniscient, omnipotent God, the all-knowing and the all-powerful God. In the song of Moses that Moses sang after God freed Israel from Egypt and drowned Pharaoh in the Red Sea, he said, The Lord is my strength and my song, and He has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise Him. That's Exodus 15, verse 2. That's what the sovereignty of God leads to. Praise. Jeremiah could also have said, This is my God. He is almighty and free. As the psalmist put it in Psalm 115, He does whatsoever He pleases in the heavens. Even choosing someone as weak as Jeremiah to be His prophet. We can't escape the sovereignty of God here. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. That means he knew him intimately. It refers to the doctrines of election and predestination. That's the idea in the word know. It means more than intellectual knowledge. Of course, it means that. It means knowledge of facts and, and things and people and all of that. But it's really a, a, a personal term as well. And in certain contexts, it has that sense of a relationship. More than knowing about someone, it is knowing someone. And it has that sense here. He, he had a relationship with, he knew Jeremiah before he ever existed. And so the sense of that is he chose him. He elected him. We, we see that sense of the, the personal aspect of knowledge in a, a variety of, of passages and Genesis chapter 4, verses 
Verse 1, we read, and, and, and Adam knew his wife Eve, and she conceived and bore a son, Cain. Well, that's no. That's the that same word that we have here. And it means more than knowing about. It means entering into a very personal, intimate relationship. We have another text that really bears very directly upon this in which this word no is used, and that's in Amos chapter 3 and verse 2, where God said of Israel, you only have I known of all the families of the earth. Now, obviously that does not mean that God had only intellectual knowledge of Israel. He didn't know about Egypt, never heard about that place. He didn't know about Moab or uh, Babylon, he never heard of those places. No, of course he knows those. He knows everything. He knows about all of the nations of the earth that have been, that were, and that would be. He established them. He knew about all of them because they were in his decree. Now this is knowledge of a personal relationship from all eternity, and it refers to God's electing love. It refers to God's commitment to Israel he means he had chosen them apart from all of the nations of the earth. And so the New American Standard Bible from which I'm teaching translates that verse, you only have I chosen of all the nations of the earth. But the word is no. And here his knowledge of Jeremiah was before his existence. He was chosen by God from all eternity to be his prophet. Jeremiah's life and calling were predestined. Don't be afraid of that, that word. You can't understand this verse or this passage without understanding the sovereign grace of God, without understanding the predestination and election of God. We can't understand God without understanding those great doctrines. This is how the Lord introduces His calling to Jeremiah. And He did it with a purpose, and that is to say to him, the universe is not random. Nothing happens by chance. In God's plan, there are no mistakes. And his choosing of Jeremiah, he was saying, was not a mistake and was not random. It's part of God's eternal plan. In his eternal plan, he knew Jeremiah from the beginning and consecrated him. He set him apart. He appointed him to be a prophet. Now, that was practical knowledge. And I mean by that, helpful knowledge. Because when Jeremiah experienced discouragement and heartbreak, of which he experienced a lot of, he could remember his call and know everything was unfolding according to the divine plan. God had a purpose for it and for him. Listen, there is nothing more practical than knowing that God is sovereign. There's nothing more practical than knowing the full range of the doctrine of the Word of God. All of the doctrines. But this doctrine is extremely practical. Nothing more practical than knowing the absolute, the doctrines of the absolute predestination and divine election of God. And why is that? Because those doctrines assure us that God is in control. And the fact that He is ensures our eternal salvation. Now, our salvation was purchased at the cross by Christ, but we are kept by the sovereign grace of God every moment of our lives. And when we realize these things, when we understand that who the God that we worship, the God that is, is infinite. The triune God is without limit. And we understand that He can overcome the biggest of the problems that we face. And He does do that. Knowing that leads to confidence in Him and confidence to live by faith when we realize that God Almighty chooses us, is always with us, and never fails us, then we join with Moses and say, this is my God. Life can be overwhelming for us, but not for Him. He's in control. And He's not just known us and been in control of things from beginning, from, from the beginning, but from 
the beginning of the beginning, from all eternity. And we need to trust Him. We need to follow Him. And in doing that, know that things will be okay. Well, Jeremiah didn't quite get that. God's purpose seemed uh, very big, in fact, too big. He was appointed a prophet to the nations. Look, to be a prophet to the nation would have been big enough, but this was to the nations. He, he didn't ask who is sufficient for these things, but he certainly felt it. The weight of responsibility was overwhelming, and he resisted God's call. I do not know how to speak, he said, because I am a youth. He was inarticulate and he was inexperienced. I don't have what it takes to do what you're asking me to do. Well, prophets all sense their unworthiness and their inadequacy when God sent them to a public ministry. And they expressed it, at least some of them did. And they resisted God's call. Moses did that. He said, I'm not eloquent. I'm slow of speech and slow of tongue. I stutter. I can't be your spokesman. Isaiah said, I'm a man of unclean lips. I'm unworthy of such a calling. And here Jeremiah said, I'm just a kid. He didn't trust himself. They didn't trust themselves, these prophets. They knew enough about themselves not to trust themselves, which really shows their wisdom. Pascal said, fear not provided you fear, but if you fear not, then fear. I don't know if uh, Lincoln read Pascal, but as soon as he won the presidency in 1860, the burden of the office weighed upon him, and he went home from the telegraph office to tell his wife. It was early in the morning. She was asleep. He woke her with the words, we are elected, then said, God help me, God help me. Now, I can't speak to Lincoln's spiritual condition, but that was the right response. And how much more is that the right response for us swimming in a sea of unbelief in this society in which we live, handling the word of God among people who are absolutely indifferent to it? Handling eternal things. And we too must pray, God help me. And we can know that if we are walking in his way, he will do that. That's the point of this introduction to Jeremiah with the Lord's affirmation of absolute sovereignty. The one who chose him from eternity and called him to be a prophet to the nations is the one who is God of the nations, who created them and has already determined their destinies. Jeremiah couldn't trust himself with such a responsibility. Not a responsibility like that to the nations? No, but he could trust the God who is the God of the nations and his appointment of him. Nothing is too difficult for the Lord. Really, human inadequacy provides opportunity for divine glory through divine enablement. God enabled both Moses and Isaiah to do great things. They were great men. They had great training. Moses was trained in all of the wisdom of Egypt. Isaiah was a brilliant man. You can tell that just from his writings. They had natural gift. They had great privilege. But that isn't the reason they were great men of God. They did great things because the Lord God enabled them and he would enable Jeremiah as well. And so he listened to the prophet's objection and then rejected it. Do not say I am a youth because everywhere I send you, you shall go and all that I command you, you shall speak. And then without Waiting for Jeremiah's consent, the Lord touched his mouth and said, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. And that's true of all the prophets. They speak the words God put in their mouth. They speak the word of God. But what he's saying here is, your objection is overruled. You are now equipped, fully equipped. 
God's will does not wait for our will. He accomplishes His will. He does whatever He pleases in heaven and on earth. He gave Jeremiah his, his message in verse 9. And then in verse 10, He gives him his task. See, I have appointed you this day over the nations and over the kingdoms to pluck up and to break down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. Jeremiah would proclaim oracles of two kinds, about the overthrow of nations and about the restoration of nations. And in chapters 45 through 51, we read the oracles against Egypt, Philistia, Moab, Ammon, Edom, Damascus, Babylon, and others. God's sovereign over all of those nations. And in principle, of course, what would be true of those is true of nations today. Every nation today is under the authority of God, even though they don't recognize that. He's in control of their destiny. Now, no doubt, Jeremiah would have preferred not to preach a theology of destruction about the uprooting and the pulling down of nations brought a lot of hardship to Jeremiah. In fact, he complains about it famously later in chapter 20 when he says to the Lord, you have deceived me. And he tries not to preach this sermon. You see the, the humanity of the prophet in this prophecy. He, the, the, the genuineness of his emotion in all of this and how it affects him, just as it, this kind of opposition would affect you and me. And he, he resists it. He speaks out almost in these words that we would consider blasphemous. You've deceived me. And he tried not to preach the message because it just brought hardship on him. And yet he said, it's like a fire in my bones. The word of God is too powerful. It comes out. It must be preached. But he would rather have preached something more pleasant, of course. He would like to have preached these agreeable prophecies about building up and restoring. And they're there. They're in the prophecy too. They're happy things. That's what he wanted to preach, but instead most of his ministry is the hard stuff of judgment. And the Lord confirms that ministry with two visions, one of an almond tree and the other of a boiling pot. The Lord asked Jeremiah what he saw and he answered, I see a rod of an almond tree. The almond is the first tree to bud in spring. They have beautiful white blossoms and are common today in Jerusalem. In fact, Anatoth is, today is a center of almond growing. The Lord then confirms the meaning of what Jeremiah had seen. You have seen well, he said, for I am watching over my word to perform it. Now, there's a, a play on words there in the original text, a kind of a prophet's pun, because the Hebrew almond and the word watching are very similar. I see a shaked almond. You have said, well, for I am shoked watching. Shaked, shoked. So just as the almond tree put forth blossoms before anything grows and indicates the coming of spring, indicates the coming of a fruitful season, so too Jeremiah's words would announce the coming of God's word and the fulfilling of it, the, the, the fruitfulness of his word. And God was watching over them to ensure that all the prophet proclaimed would be fulfilled. His words would bear fruit. The good things, the glorious things, the kingdom that he prophesies here, it will come to pass. We can be sure there will be a glorious age to come. Well, that was the positive vision, but then Jeremiah had a second vision, and this one is more sinister. It was of a boiling pot tilting southward, and the implication is that its scalding water would spill south over Anatoth and Jerusalem, prophesying that an enemy from the north would come and overrun the southern kingdom of Judah. The Lord calls it the evil. That's what would come from the north, the evil. It was not identified to Jeremiah, but we know what it is as we read through the book. It's Babylon. 
which had recently emerged as a world power. In verse 15, the Lord says the enemy would set up thrones at the gates of Jerusalem. Now, well, to, that means they'll enter Jerusalem. They'll take the strongholds of Jerusalem. It's a symbol of conquest. This is the message that Jeremiah would preach, that the Babylonians are coming and the Babylonians are conquering. And that made Jeremiah a hated man, a defeatist to his contemporaries. But this was the Lord's message, and this was the judgment that the Lord was bringing on Judah because they had broken his covenant, they had forsaken him for other gods, they had engaged in the most heinous kinds of crime and sin. And so God does not wink at sin. God is patient with the sinner for just so long, and so the patience had run out, judgment would come, and Jeremiah was called to proclaim it. He faced a long and hard ministry. He was fearful. He was reluctant. The Lord knew that. He knew his heart. And so the Lord put some steel in him. He told him to be fearless. Verse 17. Now gird up your loins and arise and speak to them all which I command you. Do not be dismayed before them or I will dismay you before them. Now the Lord doesn't attempt to disguise the situation and make it sound like it's really not going to be all that bad. It's going to really be a good experience for you. It's, he's, he's realistic. He, he has Jeremiah face reality and face, face it bravely. He tells him, be a man, in other words. Anything else wasn't really an option for Jeremiah. He was God's prophet. That was God's will and that was what was going to happen. He's already said he's with him. He needed to, to get strong. Understand that. If he lost courage, God, God would dismay him, he said. He would allow the enemy to defeat him. So he was to be faithful. Verse 17 would be a good verse for every minister to memorize. We, we are to be firm in our resolve. We are to preach God's word. We're to preach it faithfully. We are to fear Him, not fear men. We are to be faithful. That is a good verse for every preacher, every teacher, every evangelist, and every child of God. That's a good verse for you. Every one of us. Be faithful. That's the gist of it. But God never calls us to failure. He never calls us to a task that is too difficult for us, meaning too difficult or too dangerous for Him. And this, this sobering charge is followed by a very encouraging promise in verse 18. Now behold, I have made you today as a fortified city and as a pillar of iron, and as walls of bronze against the whole land to the kings of Judah, to its princes, to its priests, and to all the people of the land. Now that tells you something right there about the condition of the nation. I'm going to make you a pillar of iron, a wall of bronze, impregnable to the people of the land. This is the, this, this is the people of God, and He's protecting His prophet from His own people. He's protecting them from the princes. He's protecting them from the priests who were the mediators between God and the people, and from the king who was to guard the law and guard righteousness. And yet, they're the enemy. He's protecting Jeremiah from them. Jeremiah had uh, a difficult task before him. It certainly seemed dangerous. But this is also the great encouragement. Against all of that, he will protect him. And I think Jeremiah must have returned to that promise over the years, time and again, when he faced these difficult challenges in his life. God would make the prophet impregnable. Now, he'd have hostility, but he would be impregnable. And then we read in verse 19, They will fight against you, but they will not overcome you. For I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. Now, this is the second time 
the Lord has used the word deliver. He used it back in verse 8 where he told Jeremiah not to be afraid. He would deliver him. It's a significant word. Jeremiah would have been familiar with it because of its appearance in other passages. It was used, for example, of God delivering Israel from Egypt in Exodus chapter 3, verse 8. It was used of David as a shepherd being rescued from the paw of a lion and a bear. And recalling all of that would have been a great encouragement to Jeremiah because God had already proved himself able to deliver his people from powerful enemies. And he would do it for him. He had a public ministry of some 40 years. And they were among the most chaotic times of Israel's history. But during that time, Jeremiah was invincible. He had inward agonies. He was mocked. He was treated cruelly. But he never deviated from his course. He was tempted to. He was under constant pressure to compromise and quit, but he never did. He was a pillar of iron. That was God's doing, and He hasn't changed. The Lord God is the same, and He will make us no less a fortress and an iron pillar than He made Jeremiah. We can rely on the same promises. B.B. Warfield told his students at Princeton Seminary that very thing. Keep always before your mind the greatness of your calling that... That is to say, these two things, the immensity of the task before you, the infinitude of the resources at your disposal. In other words, your God is a big God, a great God. He is sufficient for everything. He's more than sufficient for everything. That's true for seminary students. That's true for ministers. And that is true for all Christians. All of us. It would be convenient perhaps to see this as an interesting passage of history 2,000 and a half years ago to a particular individual called to be a prophet. No, it's a, a, a message that applies directly to every one of us because we all have a calling. We have all been gifted in one way or another and all of us are to be lights in the world lights in the midst of a dark generation, and to serve God and be a witness, as Jeremiah was a witness in his generation. And we have infinite resources to do it. That's true of this church. It's true of you individually. Look to the Lord. What we do so often, though, is become fearful. We think that men or circumstances are stronger than we are, and maybe they are. But they also think they must be stronger than God and what He can do. That is foolish. I, foolish but common. And I think we must admit that, at least admit that to ourselves. We're all tempted that way, tempted to, to, to back away from any responsibilities of being the Lord's witness. But God... Never ask us to do a service for which He has not qualified us and equipped us. And He is faithful. So we're to trust in Him. It's not our brilliance that gets results. It's not our gifts. It's the Lord God. I like what Robert Murray McShane stated. It's in a letter that he wrote. I mentioned McShane last week. Uh, Scotsman who died at the early age of 29, but in the 10 years or so that he ministered in Scotland, he had a profound influence on the nation and, and on the individuals to whom he, he spoke, preached, wrote to. And in one of his letters, he wrote to a young man. It's actually a, in the collection. It's a second of these letters. And the young man was going in the ministry and Mc, McShane encourages him. And then in the second letter written in 1840, he's going abroad. He's going to Germany to study. And McShane is encouraging him to take care of things. Take care of your personal life. 
uh, he makes the point to the, to the, uh, the, 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 with the idea that our successes uh, are largely based on the attention we give to our spiritual life, our soul. He illustrated it by the, the cavalry officer. And he says, you know how the, the officer will take his saber out and he polishes it and he rubs it and gets rid of every stain on it so that it shines. He takes special care of his saber. And he says, we're that in the hand of God. We are an instrument in God's hand and we must be pure. And then he says, it is not great talents God blesses so much as great likeness to Jesus. A holy minister is an awful weapon in the hand of God. Well, that was Jeremiah. Fearful, he became faithful like Christ and an awful weapon in the hand of God. May God make all of us like that. He's able. He's able. We just need to trust him. Years ago, I was in London and visited St. Paul's Cathedral. Below is a crypt where the famous are buried. The Duke of Wellington is buried there. Admiral Nelson is buried there. In fact, their, their sarcophaguses are right next to each other, I think. They had great victories over Napoleon, one on sea, the other on land. They brought down his empire, and they raised up England's. But while I was there, a ceremony was taking place, and just as I, I came up from the crypt, I heard the words of Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 10 being read. See, I have appointed you this day over the nations and over the kingdoms to pluck up and to break down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. This is my God. This is your God. This is the only God. He is absolutely sovereign, master of heaven and earth, master of time and eternity. Who is sufficient for these things? Not me, not you, not Paul or Jeremiah, but the God of the nations is. They are like a drop from a bucket to him. And he is with us to bless us. Can you say, this is my God? You can say that if you can say, his son is my savior. Because he sent his eternal son into this world by becoming a man to die for sinners and save them from his wrath to save the nations. What you must do is believe in him. And that's all. It's not by your works, it's not by your effort, it's by receiving the free gift of God. It's by trusting in Jesus Christ as God's Son and Savior of the world. Lay hold of Him if you've not done that. Lay hold of the remedy for sin and judgment to come through faith in Him. The moment you do, you're saved. You're forgiven forever and given eternal life, the glorious hope of the world to come, the kingdom to come. Enter into that and then live for Him. May God help all of us to do that, to be faithful witnesses in this generation of ours for the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we do thank You for Your goodness to us. We thank You for a passage like this and the example we have in Jeremiah, a reluctant prophet, and understandably is... He would look at the situation he was called to speak in and speak to. It's something far beyond anything he was able to do in himself. And yet he did because it was your will and you enabled him and you will enable us. Help us to understand that. We thank you for the message you've given us, which is the only message of hope for a lost world. And we thank you that you've called us. What a blessing. What a what a privilege to have been chosen by you from the foundation of the earth to be your witnesses in this world. May we do that. May we do it faithfully. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.